morning, church. Good morning. I have my walking clothes on today because we have a walk after church, so I feel like I have to explain why I'm not dressed in Sunday church clothes. But uh, anyway, we missed, I missed being here last week, and it's so nice to see, for us at least, a few new faces, and we look forward to getting to know you even more. Um, also, if you have friends who can't come to church on Sunday, please let them know that we are live on Facebook for our service so that they can watch from home, um, right from Facebook, and uh, get those numbers up a little bit more as we're watching on Facebook Live. Also remember that on October 23rd, it's Bring a Friend Sunday. Now, my husband has these weird traditions from the past that if you bring so many people, I don't know if it's 25 here, maybe 50, no, 25. If 25 new faces come on that day, October 23rd, then the next Sunday, he will dress in some kind of weird costume. Now, I can meet you after church and tell you every costume he's been in, and it's kind of humorous. But part of the reason that, that works is because the next Sunday is also Halloween Sunday. So if there's kids in the church, they can come dressed in costume. If there's no kids, then I guess you all have to come dressed in a costume because we got to have a costume. So um, that's that for that. Now our verse today is from the book of Proverbs, which is a great book if you want to learn some good biblical wisdom, uh, going to the book of Proverbs is always a good place to start. It, this is from chapter 3, verse 33, and it says, The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but he blesses the home of the righteous. Um, let us start with prayer. Father, our heart longs to move from sinfulness to righteousness. We know that we are made righteous by Jesus, but we also know that in the economy of your kingdom, we will reap what we sow, emotionally and spiritually. Please help us to sow good things, Please help us to live generously. Use us to sow what pleases the Holy Spirit and not ourself. May our church be known in this community as a generous body of believers who care for others passionately and who demonstrates the life of Christ not only in our words but our action. God, make us happy people. Make our homes happy places. Help our nation to return to righteousness in the powerful name of Jesus. Lord, you will not be mocked by those who malign you and who do not call upon your name. Restore integrity and uprightness and wisdom and kindness to our culture today so that you will be glorified in the midst of your people. Turn the hearts of those who do not bow before you so that they may come to know the Lord Jesus Christ, our Savior. God, bless each one of our homes today. Bless our homes with righteousness, with love and devotion. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. So today I come to the end of my series of sermons titled The Good Life 
wise living from the Bible book of Proverbs. Over the past number of weeks, I have said the good life involves certain characteristics. One was good communication skills. One was good anger management skills. One was a good work ethic. One was good friends. One was a good commitment to reach people for Jesus. And that's when we set our invite a friend to church Sunday on October 23rd, and hopefully you've already praying about someone that you can invite to church that Sunday. And then last week we talked about a good sense of humor and joy. So the last element of the good life that I will deal with this morning is a good family life. I would go so far as to say that a good life is very difficult without a good, happy family life. It's like the verse Terry read from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 33. The Lord's curse is on the house of the wicked, but God blesses the home of the righteous. To have a good life, it helps to have a good family life. And again, we all want a good life. We all want to be happy. And one of the primary places that happiness is to be lived out is in our homes. You know, even if I am unhappy at work, even if I am unhappy at school, even if I am unhappy at church and I can't imagine that, I hope you'd find happiness in your home. You know, I keep a little plaque on my desk that says, happy wife, happy life. You know, last week my wife was gone to visit our daughter in Wisconsin. And even though my sermon was on joy, people could tell that I was not happy because my wife wasn't with me. So today I... I wear different designs on my tie. Today is the butterfly design because that was the theme of our wedding. And so, it's kind of like the guy who wanted to have a happy home and turn his marriage around. So he stopped and bought a box of chocolates. He stopped and bought a dozen roses. He walked into his house and gave his wife the chocolates and the roses and he told her, honey, I love you so much. His wife started to cry. Her husband asked, honey, what's wrong? His wife responded, it's been a horrible day. The kids got in trouble at school. The car broke down. I burnt dinner. And now you come home intoxicated. <laughs> we all want happy homes. And in that, and in that joke, I need to make a very important disclaimer. In my years of ministry, nothing robs a family of happiness like alcohol and substance abuse. If that's a problem in your family, seek to get help before it destroys you. The Bible verses from Proverbs chapter 3, verse 33, God blesses the home of the righteous. That word blesses means makes happy, makes joyously happy. Again, there are so many unhappy homes. When people see happy homes, they want to know how they can have a happy home. So these verses show us that God wants to bless God's people with happy homes. Now, I've divided this sermon into five elements that I included in God's blessing of a happy home. And I use the acronym HAPPY, H-A-P-P-Y. So let's start with the H, and that is humor. In happy homes, people smile, people laugh, people have joy. It's as Philippians chapter 4, verse 4 says, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, rejoice. 
You know, we talked about how joy and laughter and a sense of humor is part of the good life last week. And I purposely indicated I would postpone that point on human joy and laughter being important to the family until this week. God wants your family to be a fun place. The old saying is love makes the world go round and laughter keeps us from getting dizzy. In a family, love and laughter are two sides of the same coin. You know, wouldn't it be great if every family produced happy and fun people? So in spite of how bad your day is at work or at school, you can return and retreat to a place that is happy and fun. Tragically, too many homes are not fun places to be. Your family should have fun together, laugh together, play together. I know my wife and I try to have our, a fun day with our granddaughters once a week and our grandsons once a month. And when I say that, it's not that we like our granddaughters more than our grandsons. It's that uh, location-wise, we're closer to our granddaughters um, and can pick them up easier than our grandsons. But the point is, children are naturally fun people. In fact, my granddaughters uh, wrote a few jokes that they shared this week that I, um, gave me permission to share. Uh, you know, what do a tree and a dog have in common? Of course, they both have bark. Why did the Oreo receive an A on the test? He was one smart cookie. Why did the cookie go to the hospital? Because he felt crummy. And this was their uh, favorite, favorite joke this week um, that they used on me. How do you have an ugly child? Ask my parents. <laughs> point is, do whatever it takes to make your home a happy or happier place. Uh, make your home more fun. You know, get a joke of the day calendar and, um, and start out the day reading that. You know, last week I mentioned wearing Groucho Marx glasses here, like these, and my wife loves it when I come home and I'm wearing the Groucho Marx glasses, and, and look at her, she's wearing her Groucho Marx glasses, and we just have a, a good time doing that. <laughs> so, and I, last week I mentioned um, the Three Stooges, because I had a Three Stooges tie that I, I brought, the Three Stooges. You know, watching the Three Stooges is a great family activity to do together. You know, I'll tell you something about the Three Stooges. I had a foster son that didn't like the Three Stooges. He was, just didn't like them. I challenged him if he could watch an entire episode of the Three Stooges without smiling once, I would give him 20 bucks. He was doing okay until you see Curly getting ready to sit on the iron. You know, we've all seen it. It was coming from a million miles away. And as Curly sat on that iron, he couldn't help but crack a smile. Fun families look for events that are fun. You know, some of the friends that I have on Facebook are always finding these fun events for themselves, for their children, for their grandchildren. And uh, if you're one of those people, make sure that I'm your Facebook friend so I can see the fun places you're finding and use them myself. You know, the church here in Door hosts a game night every other month. And one of the purposes is for people and families to come and just have fun. And it is this Friday night is the game night. R am I right, Sonia? And um, maybe at game night we could have a Three Stooges room uh, for people that just want to go in and chill out there. Happy families laugh. Happy families smile. Happily families are fun places to be. And those families make a great witness for Jesus Christ. So the H in a happy family stands for humor, laughter, and joy. Then the A stands for affection and affirmation. Affection and affirmation. 
I turn in the Bible to Luke chapter 15, verse 20. It says, So he got up and went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him and ran to his son and threw his arms around him and kissed him. That is in the story that's called the story of the prodigal son. As a, runner, as a runaway son is returning home, the father runs out, throws his arms around him, and kisses him and hugs him. The father in that story represents God. God's love is demonstrated through physical affection. In happy families, husbands and wives hug and kiss. Parents and children hug and kiss. The Christian author on marriage and family named Gary Smalley talks about healthy touch in regard to family. He says that the skin is the largest organ of the human body and it needs to be touched to remain healthy. In fact, I've heard that some children have had their growth stunted physically and emotionally due to lack of touch as infants. You know, one of our granddaughters was born nine weeks premature. She was placed in this little incubator. And they had little holes that you could put your hands in, into little gloves, and touch her. And they encouraged that to aid in her growth and healing. And it must have worked because she is now taller than me or Grammy. Jesus knew the value of healthy touch and affection. Jesus' healings often involved touching. And as it says in Mark chapter 10, verse 16, it says, And Jesus took the children into his arms, placed his hands on them, and blessed them. Jesus took children and held them and blessed them. Happy families demonstrate affection in healthy ways. And the verbal element of affection is called affirmation. In the book of 1 Thessalonians, chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. Happy families create patterns of affirmation. Husbands and wives affirm one another. Parents and children affirm one another. You know, when we began a study of the good life, we talked about good communication skills. And one of those stressed was that of affirmation. Communication that affirms people rather than just tearing them down. You know, I use this illustration, but I remember hearing Bill McCartney, the founder of the men's movement called Promise Keepers. Bill McCartney had been the head football coach of the national championship Colorado Buffaloes. He was once asked if he returned to coaching, what would he do differently? He thought about it a moment and then he said, I would criticize my players a lot less and I would affirm them a lot more. The tremendous value of affirmation cannot be overstated. There is tremendous power in affirming words. You know, I know some people, they can't say something good about you without criticizing you in the process. They don't affirm naturally. But healthy and happy families learn to praise and affirm one another. So be a family that shows affection and affirmation. So H-A and then P. The first P stands for prayer. In the book of Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, it says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. Your family is always worth praying for. The old saying is, the family that prays together stays together. So pray for your family. Pray with your family. 
You know, my family always has a prayer time before meals. When our grandchildren are with us, we give them the opportunity, if they're willing, to lead in the prayer. We also let their parents or our children pray when they're with us. And of course, we pray. And that allows us to pray with one another and pray for one another and to set an example of prayer. You know, I take my granddaughters to school a couple times a week. Each time I drop them off, I remind them that I am praying for them. And as they leave, I ask God to keep them safe that day. I also send weekly prayer emails and messages to our children, letting them know I'm praying and requesting any areas of prayer they have. The other day, my sister in Florida messaged me to keep her in prayer as the devastation there happened. And please, if you know people are in Florida, please keep them in flair. My wife and I pray together regularly, and all of these prayer examples are designed to keep God at the center of family life. All of those prayer examples remind our family that communication with God needs to be regular and natural. So prayer makes for a happy family. Then there's a second P in happy, and that stands for pardoning or forgiving. You know, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 32, says, Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. You know, in any close relationship, there are going to be times when people do things that make you angry. That is particularly true in families. If families don't practice forgiveness, their survival is in jeopardy. Forgiveness is an essential element in any marriage. And again, forgiveness is not natural. What comes naturally when you get hurt is revenge. And revenge is not a healthy family trait. Forgiveness doesn't come naturally. Forgiveness is a God-given trait. It is a byproduct of God in our lives that has led to God forgiving us, and we must apply that forgiveness in our family relationships. You know, I was reading in a newspaper article recently. It said, unforgiveness has been shown to be detrimental and have detrimental effects on the human cardiovascular and immune system. Forgiveness, on the other hand, is associated with good health. Research has shown that people who are able to practice forgiveness report fewer health problems than those who say they have difficulty forgiving. So forgiveness makes for happy and healthy people. It only makes sense. Forgiveness makes for happy and healthy families. And let me add, with a forgiving spirit needs to come a willingness to ask for forgiveness. You know, I'm always asking my wife for forgiveness, right, dear? Learning to say, I'm sorry, forgive me, is a healthy trait, and it is a healthy family trait. You know, I've met people who are unable to say they are sorry and ask for forgiveness when they do wrong. And the implied assumption in that is that they're always right and they never do wrong. You know, I came across this article in regard to parents asking their children to pardon them. It reads, I can't think of many things that exemplify the reality of the gospel more than confessing sin to a child and then asking forgiveness. It is humble, it is needy, and it is upside down because the one with power and who is often perceived as a spiritual authority is putting themselves at the mercy of the young and weak. I don't just mean to confess that you are a sinner. I mean to confess sins and repent of them. Losing your temper, harsh words, not listening, failing to keep your word. Show your kids your need and you show them your faith in God to forgive and to be merciful. You are showing them the whole economy of God's grace and that you are really believe what you preach. 
It will draw them closer to you, and it will draw them closer to God. Practicing pardon and forgiveness. Practicing asking to be pardoned and forgiven. Pardon makes for a happy and healthy family. Then the final letter, Y, stands for yielding. And by yielding, I mean yielding to God. These verses from Proverbs 3 tell us that true happiness starts by yielding to God. God blesses the home of the righteous. God blesses the home of those who yield to God. One of the great verses in the Bible, Joshua 24, 15, says, Choose this day whom you will serve. But as for me and my house and my family, we will serve the Lord. A family committed to yield to and serve the Lord is on the road to real happiness. And let me close by saying this. The church is often called the family of God. The family, to be happy, needs the family of God, the church. And the family of God, to be happy, needs happy families. As a church, and as the family of God, let us also practice humor, fun, and laughter, affection and affirmation, prayer, pardon, and yielding to God. Let us strive to be one big happy family.